Did you know that in the late 1920s, there was a plan to merge Europe and Africa into one continent? Yeah, it may seem laughable at first, but it was seriously considered by some of the heads of state and even the UN at one point. But those who are aware of even the most basic geography know that the Mediterranean Sea separates Europe from Africa. So how were they planning to do that, especially since we don't have a modern-day Moses to part the sea? Well, it seems like some engineers relied on engineering to recreate this miracle, but as we now know, they failed. This all started when a German architect, Hermann Sorgel, gave the most bewildering suggestion to end all European problems. As a population grows, it needs more space to live, more food to survive, and ultimately more resources. The problem of overpopulation was not just pertinent in Germany, but also in other European nations. As the economies recovered after the devastating World War I, there was a population boom in Europe, especially in the war-neutral countries. The lifestyle gradually improved and more industries and factories were built, which ultimately required fuel to run. It's important to remember that at the time, the world was heavily reliant on fossil fuels, especially coal for their source of energy. The Saudis' oil discovery was still decades away, and there was this anxiety among the masses that these fossil fuels will eventually run out. To solve these multiple issues peacefully, Hermann Sorgel suggested draining the Mediterranean Sea to create more living space and agricultural land. After all, the Mediterranean has an extensive space of 965,000 square miles. This is equivalent to the combined area of Texas, California, and New York. Sorgel suggested creating a giant dam on the Straits of Gibraltar to block off the Atlantic supply to the Mediterranean Sea. The Straits of Gibraltar is a narrow strait that supplies seawater from the Atlantic to the Mediterranean Sea. Sorgel noted that the amount of water that evaporates from the Mediterranean Sea is higher than what it receives. The only reason its water level doesn't go down is because of the Atlantic supply from Gibraltar. Once the Mediterranean is isolated from the Atlantic, the water will eventually evaporate over time, freeing extensive swaths of land. It was estimated that this would leave 254,500 miles of new land reclaimed from the sea, an area larger than France. But was draining the Mediterranean a practical solution? And would it have been possible in today's world? Stay with us to the end to find out. If you're new to this channel, we welcome you to Visionary Builds. Here, you can find the latest news in architecture from around the world. So hit that subscribe button if you want to watch two videos weekly. Back to the topic. If you look at the Strait of Gibraltar on a map, it may look like a narrow strip, but even at its narrowest point, it's eight miles wide. Not to mention, Sorgel wasn't planning to build the dam at the narrowest point. As for its depth, Gibraltar is 3,000 feet deep at its maximum point, while it still maintains a depth of 1,000 feet at its shallowest point. Creating a dam of this dimension, especially in the 1920s, was an impossible task. It's important to note that even today, with all our technological breakthroughs in engineering, we have only two dams that pass the 1,000-foot mark. This is the Jinping-1 Dam, an arch dam in China, and the Nurek Dam in Tajikistan. The first one, Jinping stands at a height of 1,001 feet, while the Nurek goes up to 984 feet. There's no official estimate for how Gibraltar Dam would have cost, but it seems that the figure would have been in the trillions. Sorgel and his supporters believe that this project would indirectly prevent nations from going to war. This project would have cost each nation so much that they wouldn't have had the money to go to war again. Once the Mediterraneans all dried up, there'd be a direct land connection between Europe and Africa. Sorgel's plan was to merge both these continents and create a new continent called Eurafrica or Atlantropa. Furthermore, land bridges across the Sicily and Gibraltar dams would allow people to travel with ease between Europe and Africa. The hydropower generated by the dam would be enough to power half of Europe. If that wasn't enough already, there was more to his plan. He also wanted to build a second dam between Sicily and Tunisia that would divide the Mediterranean basin into two halves. Running a series of calculations, it was aimed that the sea level of the western part would be lowered by 300 feet and the eastern part by 650 feet. Active support for Atlantropo was limited to architects and planners from Germany and mostly northern European countries. Indeed, only real enthusiasm for the project was mostly felt by Germans. The concept of a Lemonstrom, which is German for a living space, was deeply ingrained in German politics since the 1890s. 
Under this ideology, Germany wanted to expand its territories to have more land and material resources for its people. This concept later became part of the Nazi Germany's policy for military expansion. Atlantropo would provide land, food, employment, electric power, and most of all, a new vision for Europe and neighboring Africa. Sorgel envisioned Africa with its resources and its land to be entirely at the disposal of Europe, a continent with plenty of space to accommodate Europe's huddled masses. If you think this was the end of Hermann Sorgel's plan, you're wrong. Draining the Mediterranean Sea wasn't enough for him. He wanted to convert the Great Sahara Desert into a green area. For this, he proposed a dam on the Congo River to provide fresh water to irrigate the Sahara and create a shipping lane to the interior of Africa. Damming the Congo River further south would create huge inland lakes to irrigate the Sahara Desert and expand farming, provide shipping routes inland, and make the climate more suitable for European settlement. Another hydroelectric dam was planned on the Sea of Marmara in Turkey to block the Black Sea out. All these dams combined were hoped to meet the energy needs of Eurafrica. Furthermore, Sorgel suggested that the power supply of Eurafrica should be managed under a single central grid that would collect the electricity from all the dams. The central grid would be overseen by an independent body that would have the power to switch off the energy supply to any country that tried to wage war or posed a danger to world peace. Completion of the entire project would have taken 150 years. Sorgel knew very well that he wouldn't be able to see its execution within its lifetime, yet he devoted his whole life campaigning for this idea. He took advantage of the popular press, radio programs, films, talks, exhibitions, and even poetry and an Atlantropa symphony. He hoped popular support would help him get the backing of politicians. In post-war Europe, he imagined the Atlantropa to be the larger-than-life project that would bring all nations together. His experience of World War I, the economic and political turmoil of the 1920s, and the rise of Nazism in Germany convinced Sorgel that a new world war could only be avoided if a radical solution was found for Europeans. With little faith in politics, Sorgel turned to technology to solve these problems, but ultimately failed. There are multiple reasons for this. Beyond the physical impracticality of the project, a project that at this scale requires multi-level cooperation. Such cooperation among nations seemed impossible, who were already torn apart by two world wars. Even in today's world, where you have intergovernmental organizations like the European Union, it's still hard for countries to see eye to eye. But perhaps the biggest setback to Atlantropa was the invention of nuclear power. The world realized that it doesn't need to spend truckloads of money when it can use nuclear energy as its source. But perhaps the biggest downside of the project was the colonial mindset of Europe towards Africa. They saw Africa as an opportunity to serve their material needs like energy and food without ever considering the opinion of the natives. Lastly, the environmental cost of draining the Mediterranean would be too high. The kind of fertile land that Sorgel was imagining wouldn't have been possible as evaporation would have left behind a dry seabed high in salts. Such land is not good for agricultural purposes, so overall, the Atlantropa wasn't a feasible solution to the European problem. Even though it received great popularity in the late 1920s to the early 1930s and again briefly in the late 1940s to the early 1950s, the project quickly disappeared from mainstream discussion. The final nail in the coffin was the death of Hermann Sorgel himself in 1952 as a result of a car accident. In 1960, the Atlantropa Institute, an association of the sponsors and supporters of the project, disbanded. Atlantropa became a thing of the past. Although Atlantropa was a far stretch from reality, it inspired millions to think big to solve today's problems. That's why today we see giant works of engineering all around us, like the Three Gorges Dam in China or the Itaipu Dam in South America. What do you think about the Atlantropa project? Could it have been possible if there was a political will? Mention your thoughts below. If you liked today's video, hit the like and subscribe button. We're committed to releasing two videos each week, so your support means a lot. We'll see you in the next video.